Goodbye. viewers recognize this picture. She is a princess and she is supposed to have been murdered in 1918 and yet she is still the central figure in one of the most baffling and romantic mysteries of the century. She is the Grand Duchess Anastasia, the youngest daughter of Tsar Nicholas II and the great granddaughter of Queen Victoria. She and her family were imprisoned in August 1917 by the revolutionary Bolshevik government in Siberia. One summer morning in 1918 the whole family together with their servants were ordered down into the cellars of their house and there they were mowed down by rifle fire, their bodies pierced with bayonets, and then burned in a mine shaft. But did Anastasia die? That is the great unsolved mystery and on its solution depends the fate of 10 million pounds which the late Tsar deposited in British banks to provide diaries for his four daughters. Since 1922, strange stories have circulated among the white Russian exiles that Anastasia lives but although she suffered frightful injuries and spent years in mental hospitals, she did not die in that terrible morning massacre on July the 17th, 1918. Today there lives in Germany a woman who claims to be Anastasia, who carries the scarred wounds that Anastasia might be expected to bear if in fact she did not share the fate of her family and whose hand carries the three-cornered scar that might have been inflicted by a Russian bandit. And it is said with reliable evidence that Anastasia was stabbed through the hand by a Russian soldier. Material for drama or the stuff of truth? Who knows? Such a story couldn't fail to appeal to the writers of fiction. And in 1953, it appeared as a television play, later that year, on the stage. The authors added to the dramatic facts a brilliant piece of fiction. A group of conspirators, led by the ex-general Bunin and his aide Chernoff, seek out a woman who can pass for Anastasia so that they can lay claim to her vast fortune. They find a woman in Paris, on the verge of suicide, who is so convincing that she might almost be Anastasia. But perhaps she is. In bringing this story to the screen, 20th Century Fox have assembled a very fine cast. Anastasia is played by Ingrid Bergman, Bunin by that wonderful new star, Yul Brynner, Helen Hayes, the leading lady of Broadway, plays the Dowager Empress of Russia, and Akim Tamirov plays Chernoff, Bunin's aide. And now we're going to take you behind the scenes to see a little of the effort and skill that goes into the making of a picture of this character. The action of the film opens in Paris, and the unit went out on location to the banks of the Seine. As the cars will suggest to you, the period of the story is 1928. Once the camera was in position, the stars, Ingrid Bergman and Neil Brenner, receive final instructions from the director, Anatole Litvak, while a group of gendarmes stand by. As you all know, films are very rarely shot in their sequence, and this scene, although it was the first to be made, is not the opening shot of the film. It is where Anastasia is first seen by one of Bunin's men as she walks towards the river with thoughts of suicide in her mind. As Ingrid Bergman walks across, Litvak watches the action through the camera, which is following her movements on the track. And now we leave Paris on the Seine for Paris in Elstree. One of the main scenes in the film is set outside the Russian church in Paris. It wasn't possible to use the actual location, so at a cost of tens of thousands of dollars, the church and its surroundings were faithfully reproduced on the lot outside Elstree Studios. This will give you some idea of the tremendous cost involved in the making of a major film. Director Litvak himself supervised every detail of the set with his personal assistant, Mike Romanov, who is in fact a Romanov of the dynasty. The scene takes place at night, and as always with color film, a great number of lights have to be used. Preparations are being made during the closing hours of daylight. 
The camera is loaded so that no time is lost when they're ready for shooting. And this is what a cinemascope camera looks like from the actor's point of view. As darkness falls, the crowd artists arrive on the set. Electricians strike their arcs. The procession of the choir, which is a main feature of this scene, is rehearsed carefully under the watchful eye of the director. The busiest man at this time is the lighting cameraman, Jack Hildyard. At the moment, he is lighting Ingrid Bergman's stand-in. Jack is one of our top cameramen, and he takes meticulous care to see that each frame of the film is a picture in itself. Even to personally adjusting the shadows cast by the foliage of the tree. In the meantime, the sound operator adjusts his equipment, and the set is now fully lit. Now, you may remember in the Paris scene, the streets were wet. But for once in England, it was a fine night, so the firemen had to use their hoses to match up. While all this is going on, Lidvac checks up on his camera angles, and the makeup men get to work on the scores of extras. The long hair and beards, traditionally worn by dignitaries of the Orthodox Church, are quite a problem for the hairdresser. Assistant director Jerry O'Hara, meanwhile, places each member of the crowd into position. A great deal of research was made to ensure that all the details of apparel and procedure of the Easter Day service are faithfully reproduced. Many of the crowd artists are, in fact, white Russians, who remember the terrible days of the Revolution. One of the major problems for Dave Aylott, the chief makeup man, is to make the lovely Ingrid look haggard. As you can see, she submits to it with great patience. Incidentally, when this film was shown in New York, the critics gave her the award for the best actress of the year. While her makeup is being adjusted, her stand-in is in position, and the assistant camera operator checks on his focus. When all is ready, Litvak gives final instructions to the stars. <laughs> he doesn't seem quite happy about Ingrid's hair. The crowd artists enter the church. Handling a crowd of this size is always a problem for the assistant director. Ingrid then takes over from her stand-in. That hair still seems to be worrying her. She looks anxiously towards the camera, but Bitvac appears confident and gives her a brief smile. They're using two cameras on this shot and the second unit is ready to go. As the procession winds its way down the steps, the cameras roll. Bonin arrives. His aide points out the pathetic figure standing under a tree. Is she the woman he's been looking for? Or is she indeed Anastasia? I wonder if you realize that those exterior scenes, though they took months to prepare and days to shoot, only run for two or three minutes on your cinema screen. Now, while the artists and the technicians have been busy working out of doors, a vast army of skilled workmen have been getting the interior sets inside the studio ready. Plasterers, carpenters, electricians, property men, set designers, all working together to provide the lavish backgrounds which are needed for the next two sequences. Now, the first set, which we're going to show you in a moment, is the bar of the Opera House in Copenhagen. And to get this set ready, hundreds of photographs were taken so that the set designers could get a replica which was true in every detail. But the work on the sets is only part of the work which has been going on. Uh, dress designers and costumiers have been busy preparing the hundreds of uniforms, dresses and costumes for the stars and, of course, for the extras. On the stage the next morning, all is ready for shooting. Here, from a vantage point high above the set, we look down on a scene of spectacular grandeur as hundreds of crowd artists take up their positions. In order to get them ready in time, the makeup and hairdressing teams have been hard at work since seven that morning. Director Litvak lines up his first shot of the day, while his assistant director rehearses the extras. Jack Hildyard once again sets his lighting plan. The director checks on the dialogue with that invaluable person, the continuity girl. A few final touches of makeup and last minute instructions are given to the extras. 
Ingrid refreshes her memory from the script before the final rehearsal of the scene where she meets her supposed childhood sweetheart, Prince Paul, played by Van Desney. Akim Tamirov plays Chernoff, one of Bunin's chief conspirators. Ingrid is looking really her most beautiful, very different from the haggard woman we saw outside the church. She turns to meet Prince Paul. Will he accept her as Anastasia? One of the advantages of being a cinema goer is that you can go wherever the camera cares to take you. You can peep through keyholes and even in some cases move through solid walls. Now you can see for yourselves how this is done. As the camera moves forward, a whole section of the set is moved aside, silently and easily. The camera, complete with its crew, glides forward on a huge camera crane, which is only one of the many pieces of elaborate equipment used in the making of a motion picture. Several days later, we find the crowd artists enjoying a well-deserved break from the hot arc lights. In the meantime, work goes on to complete the great Paris ballroom set, where Anastasia will be presented to the Russian emigre nobility. To light this magnificent set, which recalls all the splendor of the Russian court, extra arc lamps have to be installed. Tea break over, the extras return to this enormous set, which is certainly quite an achievement for art director Andreev. Apart from the clever construction, it is most beautifully dressed with tapestries, chandeliers, and statuary. Jack Hilliard is carrying out his formidable task of lighting, using electrical power to the extent of thousands of watts. The girl standing by his side is Yul Brynner's stepsister. And as the artists take over from their stand-ins, we see the beautiful gown which was designed for Ingrid Bergman by the famous dress designer Balenciaga. The scene is now set for the great ball which Anastasia and Prince Paul open. As the waltz begins, the camera turns. You can see from this angle the size of the ballroom. It is in fact the largest set ever to be constructed in Europe. Now here is another shot in the same sequence. The camera tracks in high over the heads of the watching crowd in order to pick up the stars in a closer shot. Dancing for the screen is comparatively simple in long shot, but when dialogue has to be recorded in a close shot, it's far more difficult and requires considerable rehearsal. Here is Litvak showing his stars the exact positions he wants them to keep. Now you can see why it's so important for them to keep to their rehearsal positions, because the camera has to follow their movements across the floor on a camera track. Even the crowd artist's movements have to be most carefully timed and directed. This is one of the many jobs of the assistant director, Jerry O'Hara. As Ingrid dances to the gracious strains of the waltz, one more scene of Anastasia is, as they say in the studios, in the cab. Of course, you've only seen a very small part of the making of this film. It was years in the preparation and months in the shooting. But perhaps now you have some idea of the large numbers of skilled people who are involved in producing a film of this kind, to say nothing of the artistic and technical difficulties to be overcome. All these talents have combined to complete the film. And now it is up to you, the public, to judge whether they've been successful.